Hello, Judith. Hello, everybody. Judith's got a hand up already. Judith. So let's just think this 45 minutes will make a bit longer. We're here together to look at our minds, work things out, see if we can be in charge of our lives uh, so we can be a benefit to ourselves and others. Okay. So Judith, what's your question? Unmute, sweetie pie. Unmute, darling. I have a couple, but I don't want a hog. So I'll start with one and then... Don't you worry, sweetheart. It's okay. good for everybody. Everybody has my, the same... My first question has to do with labeling. If you say thought versus resentment, getting specific. My second question is crawling into grasping, clinging, and craving. Uh -huh. Who are they? How do they relate? Are they different? Okay. Okay, good. And the third question would be with dissatisfaction. Okay, but so what's the first we'll question? Let's start, with let's start with the first one. What was the first yeah. question? I didn't understand the first one. Well, it, in meditation, and I'm getting closer, the thought occurs. I was taught, just name it thought and let it go. Oh, I see what you're For saying. For instance, the other day I'm in meditation mm -hmm. and there was absolutely no question what mm -hmm. came through my mind was resentment. I understand, yeah. So I, I, I knew it was resentment. I could let it go, but it seemed to me knowing it was resentment. Had I understand. Mm -hmm. That's my I hear point. your point exactly, Judith. So I think this is a really good point. Okay, the whole point here, Judith, is it's a question of which kind of meditation we're doing there's so many approaches there's many many little techniques so the one technique that you're discussing and this is a very good approach it's a really powerful approach is you simply stand back and just watch with no this is one particular approach you stand back and you just allow the thoughts to come and go with no commentary no involvement no opinion. This is a very specific technique. And it's a really excellent one. Because as you know, in our normal daily life, we are totally absorbed in all our thoughts, we don't even know what they're saying, until they suddenly come out of your mouth, or you want to punch your sister, because you're so resentful, because you didn't notice it. So this is a marvelous, very specific technique to, and it's, there are many, many, many approaches. And that's what exactly what I'm going to discuss here. So this is a, gr a brilliant one. Because, you know, when Normally, okay, normally we know in our ordinary world, because we didn't learn these kinds of techniques, even though they've been around for two and a half thousand years, you know, clever people invented them a long time ago. Normally, we know in our lives, we don't notice what is happening in the mind because we're so busy with the outside world. It's true, isn't it? So this is normal, ordinary human life. We wake up in the morning, we get busy with our jobs, with the breakfast, with getting dressed, with going here, with going shopping, our little list of to-do things. And then we only notice what's happening inside us when, the, when it becomes emotional. You understand, we become emotional. So that's the trouble is with that, it's a bit late to notice because now it's already too emotional and you can't control it. So this really brilliant technique, a starting point is you simply sit down like you're doing <clears throat> and this particular technique you, is specifically not to have an opinion. But in the back of your mind, you can't help but notice that. So then one way you could argue, you do that technique for a few minutes and you simply train yourself not to get involved, not to have an opinion. It's very helpful. Then when you're out of meditation, naturally, because you've been practicing merely observing, you've learned the skill to notice what's happening in your mind. So when you're doing the dishes, when you're driving the car, you now not just notice the dishes in the car, but you also notice your own mind. And now you can, now you can, you, you need to use the skill to discriminate what on earth is going on in your mind. You need to notice it is called resentment. One is called love. One is called forgiveness. One is called patience. Of course, you must do that eventually. Otherwise, you just become, become some kind of, you know, um, ignorant person but it's a specific technique to train ourselves to step back that's its benefit but the benefit of the stepping back is in your daily life you need to apply in other words like you're if you're driving the car just using this as an analogy if you don't know how to discriminate which way to turn the wheel whether you should turn right whether you should slow down whether you should speed up you'll go crazy you must learn to do that that's using intelligence so that you can do in your daily life that's what lama yeshi means by be your own therapist so that's brilliant but also another approach 
So that's a good meditation and it helps you focus. It helps you not get involved in the thoughts and it helps you develop this ability to observe. And then you can start putting wisdom into it when you, when you, when you open up your eyes. You understand what I'm saying? You get my point? Yes. Because this is exactly the point. Eventually, the only reason, Judith, we're going to just observe our thoughts is because so that we can observe and use intelligence to identify resentment, anger, love, kindness. And the next step would be to proactively lessen the neuroses and actually proactively have the positive thoughts. Then we can really be in charge of the thinking process. You understand? So there are stages of that. That's the point. Because the final goal is to be totally in charge of our thoughts, Judith, and to be completely subdued in the neurotic ones and be completely developed in the good ones. That's, that's the goal. So there are various techniques that help us accomplish that. Each has their own purpose. You understand me, Judith? That's the first answer. So what's the next question? Um, the second one. Yes, the, about grasping, clinging, and craving. Oh, they're all used fairly synonymously. There are, very, there are levels and levels of them. The general word attachment, broadly speaking in Buddhism, is this emotion, kind of it's multifaceted and it can be referred to as levels of grasping, craving, you know, it's like emotional hunger and it's very subtle inside us. And at a grosser level, it's the one that grasps at the chocolate cake, grasps at the grandchild, over-exaggerates their deliciousness. Then we become kind of political and angry and upset and have arguments. So it's a, it's a primordially deep state of mind for the Buddha, but we have to st start to identify it in the simplest way. And then there are levels of it, you know, it can be really, so if you're a junkie, that's called attachment, but it's an intensely powerful level. If you're attached to your video games for five hours a day, that's really intense attachment. If you're attached to eating 17 pieces of cake every day, that's an extreme example of attachment. So it's this constant emotional hunger within us that's got many, many levels. And the more we understand this, the more we really can begin to understand the way Buddha says why we suffer and therefore why we harm others. Do you understand? Yes. And the third question? Was dissatisfaction. I'm beginning to sense this is all about attachment. True, darling, is exactly funny. right. This is what's so interesting, but the most primordial energetic level of attachment, if you like, put it that way, and we're all born with it, is, is dissatisfaction. So if you think about it, what... <laughs> We, why would be, we be always emotionally hungry for something more, whether it's a cake or another piece of music or a new handbag or another friend? It's because we don't feel satisfied already. So we're always thinking something's missing. So we're always hankering after something. So the proactive energy of attachment is the, is the, is the proactive, what can I look for? But it comes from dissatisfaction. It comes from this assumption that we just don't have enough or even more primarily more dearly that I am not enough. We experience that very deeply in our culture. So dissatisfaction is the energy of attachment deep inside us. You understand? Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you, Judith. Really perfect questions. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank so, you. Thank you, darling. What else, people? There's Megan. Where are you, Megan? Hi. Where are you? Oh, I'm in Newfoundland, Canada. Oh, are you? Oh, very good. Happy to see you. Okay. You too. Okay. Have any questions? No? Uh, not yet. Okay, good. I'm no sure problem. <laughs> Anybody else? Talk to me, people. Any questions of any kind? Nothing there? No questions Nothing. in the chat. Nothing there, Lou. Okay, good. So, um... I mean, it's interesting, a, friend, a person just wrote recently and said, she said, you know, I, she's been hearing, you know, we say the same things all the time. Well, it's true. It's true. But I think the point is that this, the, the things that this, at this level, talking about Buddhist psychology, it goes to such primordial levels, you know. I mean, we could hear about it endlessly. And every time we hear it, if the, the real skill is to hear it at an ever deeper level. If we think, oh, I've already heard that all before, then we've lost the plot, you know, because we haven't even really begun to dig deep. I remember Lama Yeshe, I always quote, he said, I could tell you about attachment for one whole year. You'll never begin to understand it until, until we dig deep inside, you know. And I can find myself every time I speak about it, it's never boring because every time I speak about it, 
tiny little bit more clarity comes, you know, because it goes incredibly deep. The level to which the level to which the Buddha would describe these neuroses in our mind is incredibly subtle. It's very fascinating, you know. So anybody else have any questions whatsoever about anything at all? I'm sorry. I think Laura has a question. Who does? Laura. Hello, Laura. Hi. Speak to me, sweetheart. Wonderful to see you. I um I don't know if it's so much of a question, but just a follow up on Judith's point. Yeah. Um, I find myself sometimes in meditation when I am uh, notating what sort of thought it is, so that I can move on. I find myself very much anxious about getting it right, which uh, I think okay. is part of the reason why I need to meditate in the first place is my anxiety. But I find myself very much wrapped up in trying to make sure I'm labeling it exactly right. And then I can't move on. So I don't know if you have uh, any suggestions for that. Right. So darling, one, I think it's important because there are so many kinds of meditation techniques and we can also make up our own. So why don't you tell me the specific technique that you think you're describing here and then because i mean you know one e one technique is simply to watch and not label but that there are others and we actually call them analytical meditations where you would in fully engage in logic and analysis to identify the thought like just like judith did that's resentment and then you would argue with it using wisdom so there's a, we have a very specific approach called that we actually call it analytical meditation mm. so what tell me what technique you are describing that you might do Oh but, goodness. I'm not sure if I know the, the vocabulary. Really matter, but... Just tell me what you think you're doing. It doesn't matter because you can make up your own. Don't worry about yeah. it. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm, I'm recognizing that I'm having a thought and then I simply just uh, try to understand what type of thought it is. So to okay. Judith's point, um, okay. resentment or something like that, or frustration or sadness. Okay. And then I'm not analyzing it any further beyond that. I'm simply trying to label it so that I can then kind of clear my mind and move on. Mm -hmm. But I, that's the labeling is not analytical. It's more just, just labeling, getting caught up labeling. in getting it right. Yeah. Just well, labeling. I, understand. I know. I think, I mean, I think that trying to get it right is a very strong impulse in all of us. You know, Laura, we try to be all, we're, try, we're all trying to be good girls. You know, we can't help it. It's one of the deepest way that ego functions. And one of the deepest attachments we have, we're very attached to being sort of our view of ourselves as a good girl. And almost as if we're hearing mummy praises or daddy praises or the outside world. It's quite subtle in us. We all have that, Laura. So it's like, we've got to sort of be a little bit humble and with ourselves and accept that you might not get it. I mean, it's almost impossible. How can we possibly get anything right first step? It's impossible. We'll go crazy. If you want, if you think it's almost like the irony is it's like, oh, I'm not going to start to ride a bike until I can ride it perfectly. I mean, it's catch 22. You've mm -hmm. got to make mistakes and fall off your bike in order to ride the bike properly. So we've got to recognize this is part of the process of learning and really welcome it, Laura, and welcome it and be humble enough to know we can make mistakes in order to learn from it. Otherwise, how can we, by definition, learning something means making a mistake, identifying and fixing it, isn't it? Yeah. So really to give yourself a little bit more space. I mean, we're all like this, sweetheart, I promise you. I really <laughs> promise. But And you just have to catch that. And that's actually, that thought is labeled attachment to how people see me, attachment to being a good girl. I mean, it sounds cute. Buddha didn't call it that, but it's a really great name for it. We've got it all very deeply. And it often determines the things we say to other people because we're always instinctively checking the response we get to make sure that we said and did the right thing. This is since we're born, honey. It's a very yeah. deep one. So we need to get the courage to just allow yourself to make a mistake, allow yourself to fall over and pick yourself up again and learn from it. It's really all right, Laura, really and truly, darling. Thank you. I understand I that one. That. That's Thank a thousand you. times a day, by the way, you know, <laughs> catching it. It's a huge one. We've all got it to one degree or another, you know. Thank you. You understand? Good, darling. Thank you, Laura. It's a really important point. Who else? People, other things to say. All these points are always so perfect when they come up. It's really excellent, you know. What else is there? Lou, nothing. See, another, just another way to talk about all this is just something interesting now, because I do this, you know, in, in my website, there's a blog, a little, you know, sometimes a thousand words, something, and I'm just writing one now. And it's exactly about this, actually. It's this interesting point that, um, just to remember it, it's, it's really interesting. You know, Lama Zopa says, we can mould our mind into any shape we like, which is a wonderful saying. And the thing is, what's fascinating, you think about this, in our culture, 
where we're so technologically brilliant, we absolutely know we can mold our mind into the shape of a carpenter, a musician, the most, some of the most genius physician, you know, physicist, a physician, anything you like. We know there are techniques. We know there are people out there who've accomplished it. So we have complete confidence and we know you can start with knowing nothing to becoming this marvelously accomplished person. And we know if you analyze it carefully, the job is molding completely radically reconfiguring your thoughts, developing millions of new thoughts about things. Think of it this way. We don't call it that, but think about that way. We're, we're developing new thoughts. We're learning thoughts about math, thoughts about music, and we can learn them. We memorize them and we slowly become that person. It's a good way to put it. But when it comes to being a happy, wise, fulfilled, content, compassionate person, we do not think that's possible at all all so why not this is the big question because it's exactly the same approach certainly from the buddhist perspective but it sounds almost absurd to say it this way and the the fundamental reason is because we are all utterly believe from the second we wake up and since we're born until the second we wake up in the morning until the second we go to sleep at night we are completely convinced <coughs> that in fact the causes of my becoming happy, wise, fulfilled, content person are not my thoughts or my mind, but of the outside world. Have a look. We spend our lives molding the outside world into exactly the shape we want. Look at us. I mean, it's not moralistic. It's practical. We observe it. It's automatic. No one taught us. Our mother didn't teach us this. As soon as, you know, as, so as soon as so we're driven, this is the thing, we're driven by this emotional hunger that's called attachment, which is what believes this totally. It believe, This thought process in us called attachment, which is primordial, believes that the right cake, the right words, the right music, the right shape, the right sound out there is what we have to get. Then the result is I will feel happy. But the Buddha's got exactly the opposite approach. You learn to change your thoughts from being attached, angry, neurotic, resentful, jealous, pointing fingers, blaming, victimhood. These are the names of the thoughts that don't believe that I have any ability to change my mind, that don't even believe that I can do it and believe totally that the outside world is the source. What do you think anger is? Anger is how dare that be the way it is? That's not what I want. How dare you say that? How dare the red light come? How dare my sister say that? This is automatic. And these thoughts, Buddha says, we've learned these for eons. I mean, we might not think about reincarnation, but as an interesting point, we come in with these thoughts fully programmed into this life, which is why they're so deeply entrenched. So the, the simple idea that I can change my thoughts from neurotic, deluded, ridiculous, attached, fearful, jealous, to wise, kind, compassionate, and loving is all that Buddha is saying. But it's just the hardest work we'll ever do because we are addicted to the opposite. You know, It's kind of interesting. So this is the job. I'm all, exactly what we're discussing here You know, with Laura's point, with Judah's point. By doing these little techniques, and there are so many variations of them coming from the Buddha, coming from these, actually from these Indians before the Buddha, as the Dalai Lama said, it was these Indians more than 3,000 years ago who were the ones who began the investigation into the nature of self. They, they invented these little techniques, you know, more than 3,000 years ago, Buddha came out of that system. So there are these brilliant little techniques that start enabling us to even notice what the hell is going on in our mind. I mean, as I said, the biggest problem we have is because we don't pay attention to the mind. We only, from the time we wake up, because we are sensory, we pay attention to the objects of our senses, which by definition is the outside world. So then we, we naturally see something we don't like, so we try to fix it. And then we think, oh, now I feel better. So we assume the right cake. You ask for the chocolate cake and you get the chocolate cake. It seems to trigger a present feeling. It does. So we assume getting the chocolate cake is the way to get happy feelings. And then when you get the carrot cake, you have unhappy feelings. So we blame the carrot cake. But we also blame the chocolate cake for making me happy. The Buddha says, that's fine. If you can get the chocolate cake every time, great. But you can't guarantee it. So why not change the thoughts? So when you might like chocolate cake, but if you get the carrot cake, you can learn not to have a mental breakdown. 
learn to be steady, learn to be, learn to kind of navigate it, you know, because we can guarantee, we know from our lives, we cannot get every single thing we want every second. This is our experience. So all Buddha is giving us is skills to become familiar with the thought processes before they be vomit out our mouth, before they become emotional, or before you can't get out of bed because you are inert with depression, you know. So in other words, we leave it till too late to see what's going on inside here. That's the skill we have to learn. So it's not comfortable. I mean, it's not comfortable. A friend of mine who's a Buddhist and a therapist, as she says, it's having your hands in your own shit. It is not comfortable. But this is the job we have to do. We have to do it. We have to be courageous. And the real skill, of course, is knowing that our mind is not set in stone. And that's one of the tragic, the tragic assumptions we have. I am this kind of person. I am a depressed person. I am an angry person. I am a jealous person. I am not intelligent. We have these very fixed views. So the thing is, there might be anger there. There might be depression there. But one of the ironies of ego in Buddhism is we exaggerate and set in stone these characteristics. You know, yes, you might be angry, but it doesn't, it's not the whole of you. You might be depressed, but it doesn't, you know, but what we do is we take those and we paint the whole of ourselves with those brushes. This is the this is the irony of ego. We're set in stone, you know, and it's so tragic. But there's not a millisecond of any thought we can't change. It's hard work, but to have the confidence we can do it and to have the confidence to want to observe our mind and have the courage to own what is there without fear and that's not necessarily easy because there's lots of junk in there and there's lots of stuff we've suppressed all our lives so we don't like it when it comes up to the surface and that's why it's important to have good friends good support or good therapist whatever you want you know we need support in this job because it's a pretty intense job we're trying to do so as long as we have the the big view you know that we can mold our mind into a wise, happy, content, fulfilled, courageous person. It absolutely takes time. It is not easy. But if we have confidence we can do it, we'll persevere. And, of course, it's important to get the right techniques, get good, good teachers, good support. I mean, there's a lot of wacky people out there, and the trouble is in our culture, as soon as we say spiritual, we, we mystify it, you know. But we're talking very down-to-earth practical techniques here. This is a doable psychological job. Don't distinguish spiritual from psychological, I promise. It's really a, it's, it makes it very mysterious, and it's not like that. It's just hard work, you know. So there's two, there's two. So the starting point in Buddhism is very practical. The very first level, entry level, junior school, grade one level. It's not even look at your mind yet. And this always sounds so hilarious, but this is a really huge point. is that um, we have to, given that attachment and anger and resentment are kind of these automatic tendencies, you also have love and kindness, and they're automatic too, maybe some stronger, some less. But given the neurotic ones kind of seem loom large in our mind, the thing is our body and our speech, which is the person, the body we've got, they are like the servants of our thoughts, aren't they? So if you're not conscious, like, you know, like Judith was saying, you're not aware of the resentment and suddenly you see, you hear yourself saying those mean words to your sister, you're, you're just as surprised as anybody else. You didn't even see them coming. It's because, yes, you can't control your mind, but because we, because we can't see what's going on in our mind, therefore we can't control its servants, which is our speech. In our case, our speech. Most of us don't go around raping and killing too many people, but look at our speech, people. So much harm is done with our words, you know. So this is why an amazing first level of practice, entry level, junior school, grade one, and don't discount this, don't think it sounds boring, is to is simply to develop discipline. Control your body, control your speech. And don't just think it's someone trying to suppress you, you know. It's you're the beneficiary of this. If you can control your speech, you know yourself as soon as those words come out the mouth, it's too late. You can't bring them back. So if you know you can control your speech consciously and intentionally, <clears throat> then you're the beneficiary. You're the beneficiary. And then you have more power and more ability to now pay attention to the mind. It's so logical. So the very first level of practice is control the body and speech. The next level of practice is to control the thoughts. So which, which thoughts are we trying to control? Obviously, the neurotic ones, the attachment, the fears, the anger, the resentment. We want to control those. I mean, then we've got other thoughts as well, love and kindness and compassion. But the emphasis is to 
can't try to have 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 some kind of control, intelligent control over the neurotic thoughts before they run the show. Then we have the space to go to the next level of practice of proactively, consciously, intentionally having and saying positive thoughts. So sometimes we can leap into, there's a nice analogy, as many of you have heard a thousand times, I use it all the time, and I think it's amazing, is a bird needs two wings, wisdom and compassion. So the wisdom wing is all this work we're discussing here, all the nuts and bolts of controlling our own body and our own speech and our own mind. Then the compassion wing is on the basis of success at putting yourself together to some degree, you now have the space to open your eyes and go, oh my God, we're all in the same boat here. And now you can begin to proactively cultivate positive thoughts and do positive actions and say positive words. Sometimes though, if we're not so aware of our heart, of our mind, and we are good girls, and I'm not trying to be sarcastic here, and we're not, and we're not noticing our attachment and our neediness to be seen as a good girl, we can walk around being very nice people, but then we wonder why we get used as a doormat. We wonder why people are abusing us easily. It's because we've not noticed our own fears and our own dramas and our need to be seen as a good girl. And we run around being mummy's little helper and saying all the nice things and doing all the nice things, but it's driven often by this attachment to being seen as a good girl. That's a real trap for a lot of us, you know? So this is why it's so important to do the inner work first and then to that degree you can be consciously intentionally aware and proactively instead of first of all you control the body and speech you don't say the negative word then you start to control the thoughts and try to analyze and calm down the negative thoughts now you can proactively say loving kind forgiving patient positive words and do positive actions to help others it's a gradual progress it's got logic to it if you can understand it you know there's one step at a time one step at a time and we have to know where we are at in this process you know are we communicating people i'm sure yes so you have to know, I mean, someone like me, who very easily always said exactly what I felt like, exactly what I did. I had no concern about what people thought. I mean, I, I want people to love me, but I was arrogant, you know. So I've got to learn to control my thoughts. Some of you might be such good girls, you're only ever saying good thoughts, ever saying nice things, ever always saying yes, always saying I will do it, I'm being mummy's little helper. There is kindness in that. Don't criticize yourself. Don't throw out the kindness. But we've got to look more deeply inside and see the unhappy part that drives us. And this is why ego isn't just big and loud and strong. Ego can be very soft and kind of quiet, but sort of it's driven by attachment and neediness and emotional hunger to be seen as a nice little person. This is very deep in all of us. So we have to know our minds very well. And sometimes the bravest thing a person can do is say, no, I'm too busy at the moment. I can't help you. That's very scary for some people, you know. So we have to know where we're at and know what's the, the wisest approach. And that just comes slowly. And this knowledge of ourselves is, is like really, it's like a serious job to be done, you know. It's not a mysterious job. It's a very doable job, but it takes time and effort. And as I said to Laura, we have to really be prepared to be humble and make mistakes. We can't just be good all the time. It's not possible to be right. You can't possibly learn anything and be right first time. It's just it's an absurd expectation of ourselves, you know. So what do you think, people? Any thoughts to have? Any questions on that? No? Nothing? Nothing, people? Well, why don't we do a little meditation? Shall we do that? So we'll do, um, there's so many, I mean, as I said to Judith, there are, oh, Judith, want to say something go on judith no it's okay no i want you to come on say it okay i was just going to ask in terms of this good girl yes and looking underneath keeping the positive part how do you get that far inside i know it's a process but it is a process judith I mean, highlights to that or anything i think Judith, I think no, perseverance is just perseverance okay. darling i mean i think when we we know that's true when it comes to anything let's say you know zero about nutrition nothing and you might look at a person and see well they're a bit they're a bit fat and maybe they eat the wrong way but you can't tell but you know yourself and the more you learn that skill of nutrition every time you look at another human being you get slightly deeper knowledge of 
where their problem is. We can we know that it's logical. Everything. If you never know any music, but you start to learn music, as soon as you hear one person playing, you have the wisdom to assess where they are at. But it got to come from your own wisdom first. You got to learn that wisdom for yourself first. And it it is doable and possible. And it's just a question of persevering, Judith. Then, uh, and I've not been instructed on analytical meditation. But mm. my question is, if inside one had begun to sense that under the behavior of good girl mm. was something else. Yes, that's right. An analytical technique uh, to do a meditation. Well, no, I think like just, that on that point. I mean, the analytical meditation just means, I mean, the way they describe it, in a, it's like really in the in the monastic university system, it's quite a sophisticated in the way they study the philosophy and everything. It's quite a sophisticated, quite sophisticated level of utilizing logic. But here the idea is: let's just say you um, you know, let's say you just you, you there's a person you you're trying to be you're being kind to, but it's a person who kind of maybe, I don't know, you, you, you know yourself that you're kind of trying to be nice to them or you, you're noticing, you just know vaguely this idea that it's also, okay, what am I, I'm going around in circles. I mean, an example would be if someone asks you to help them and you're, you've got the tendency to always say yes. And let's say that moment that actually is quite difficult for you. You've got certain other things on, but you, there's a feeling, we have a strong feeling with some people, or we don't want to upset them. We don't, it could be our sister, it could be a good friend. And sometimes we feel like they're kind of like dominating us a little bit. It's quite subtle sometimes. So you're always eager to say yes. Well, catch that, feel that discomfort and know that's coming from your, we call it, oh, I don't want to upset her, but actually we don't want her to dislike us. Mm -hmm. That's something I think when there's a, a feeling of discomfort with a person. So in other words, if you have a little grandchild and you're, you know you're completely the boss, you know you're in control and you can be very wise with that child, you can say, no, darling, I do not want you to do that and there's no fear there. But you switch it around. There's always this dynamic, I think, of power between people. And some people we feel less powerful than and they're the ones who are a bit more bossy. They maybe get angry more easily. And we always feel, oh, I don't want to upset them. But actually, it's I don't want them to dislike me. So just to notice this feeling, and that is an indicator that inside there's this attachment in there to want to be seen as a good girl and afraid of upsetting the apple cart. So then you check if, if you, you know, if, if you really can't help that person this second, notice that and then have attempt to grow the courage to say, well, actually, I'm really sorry. It's just not possible today and have that courage. But you gotta, you, you'll feel the discomfort. I mean, if we notice whenever we're with people, whether it's your grandchild, your sister, a stranger, almost within a minute, there's a feel of a power dynamic. Do you know what I mean by that, Judith? Yes. Sure. So then you've got to feel your role. So sometimes our role is to be a bit less, to always be kind, and we're worried about setting that person, that kind of thing. So just notice these things. And then the analysis might be not then, but afterwards, you just kind of try to look inside, give yourself space, step back, and just try and notice what's going on in there. I mean, well, it comes slowly, Judith. We just have to pay attention, have the wish to pay attention to all the conversations in our head. And we get better and better at identifying. I call them all my roommates. You know, you've got your wise roommates, your crazy roommates, your fearful roommates. They're just your thoughts, you know. And all these emotions are rooted in being thoughts. You understand? It's a slow process. I mean, I'm being very casual about it here, not very kind of like too strict. It's just learning to want to pay attention. And I can see that with you. You absolutely are doing that. And we just get more wise as we go on. The key thing about Buddhist psychology is that he distinguishes, and this is unique to the Buddha's approach to the contents of the mind, dividing into two categories, the kind, appropriate, reasonable states of mind that are kind of common sense, kind, generous, wise, forgiving, self-respectful, and then the neurotic ones, the fearful ones, the ones that make us feel unhappy and nervous, attachment, 
anger, resentful, jealous. They can be quite subtle, but if they feel uncomfortable, then it's one of those. If it feels spacious, like if you're with your grandchild and there's no threat and you're full of affection for this person, you know there's more positive thoughts prevailing at that moment. If you're with that other person who makes you feel slightly uncomfortable, you know there's some kind of unhappiness of about the one of the attachment or fears inside. We just have to, these are the feelings around these thoughts and stuff, but there's a positive, virtuous, appropriate, courageous thoughts and the neurotic, I-based, fear-based thoughts that make us unhappy and separate us from others. They simply refer to them as negative and positive or virtuous and non-virtuous, you know, understand? But they've got this real character to them and we can identify the difference. We can see the difference. So that skill gets better and better and better, Judith. Do you understand, Dolan? Good. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I just think what it was do a simple kind of meditation. There's so many kinds of meditations. I mean, one is, you know, the one that Judith mentioned, and it's simply observing the thoughts and not having any commentary. And what and the benefit of that is simply developing the skill to step out of our head because normally we're just swimming in our thoughts but completely unconsciously you understand and so this technique is simply the skill to step back like there's a, about a hundred people outside your window all shouting and yelling and instead of getting angry with their thoughts and what does he mean by that and what does she mean by that and how dare they say this you just let them say whatever they like and have no opinion it's a really good practice it's a really but inevitably, this is the point, Judith, out of the corner of your mind, you're not saying it then, but you can't help but notice there's anger, there's jealousy, there's resentment, and that's good. And you bring that skill to bear when you get off your meditation cushion and you're doing the dishes or driving the car, you need to use that discrimination. Otherwise, you'll be in big trouble, you know, and that's doing, the, that's doing analysis in daily life. And that's super intelligent. You've got to do that. Distinguish what the hell is going on in your mind. Otherwise, you go crazy. And then you learn to know what to do with what's there. That's the next step. If you hear the angry thoughts going out of control, this is, this is okay, this is the added point. Well, forget the meditation, I'm sorry. This is all like a meditation. So the ne one next step would be if you, if you hear the anger, let's say the resentment, and it's really built up and you can't let it go because it's so strong, but you've only noticed it while it's, when it's about the level of screaming, that's when... Maybe analysis is too difficult because what you do is you'd bring out one of your good roommates, the opposite to resentment, and you'd quietly argue with resentment, you know. You'd try to look in, have a kind roommate arguing with this crazy roommate. If you can do that, fine, but usually when the thoughts are really strong, it's very hard to do the analysis because the, 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 the resentment roommate's got out of control. So then notice it's resentment, and this is the other thing now. This is a key specific practice. You hear the resentment, you hear the anger, but this other practice is you hear what resentment is saying and normally we totally believe that story. We believe that that is true, but here the practice is don't believe what it's saying. Think of it like a stranger in your head saying all these words and it's just don't buy into the story of resentment, the story of anger. How dare she do that to me? What is how? And, you know, we're so convinced it's absolutely set in stone. So the practice here is you hear it, you can't stop it because it's strong, but you practice not believing in that story, not buying into that story. That's a pretty powerful practice, I tell you. So you, you have to let the resentment rave on. Let it rave on. This crazy roommate in your head, you can't suffocate it. She's too loud now. So you just listen, but don't buy into the story. That's powerful, Judith. That's another one. Yes, Laura. I just, yeah, I had a follow-up on that. So yeah, sure. um, that's very helpful. And I'm wondering, sometimes when I'm taking that approach, I am visualizing. And I'm wondering yeah. if that's, creates too much detachment from How do you mean by visualizing give an example um instead if i'm not doing the labeling if i'm doing visualization i will just kind of visualize maybe clouds moving kind of thoughts being clouds and letting them move on it's in your meditation you mean yeah oh, okay and that works it helps kind of clear okay. on to the next but i wonder if that's not no, allowing me to kind of sit in it honey. No, whatever technique you like that works for you. But the thing is, what I'm suggesting here is when, you know, you have a really strong emotion, when the, it's so strong, 
that it, it won't go away. And that's very common when we go crazy. People in, in daily life, you just, you're, you're so unhappy, you're so jealous, you're so angry, you're so resentment, you can't believe it, you know. So that's when the, when the thoughts are really strong, when you can't just float them away. I don't just mean in your meditation, darling, I mean in ordinary daily life. Mm -hmm. Then this other technique is really powerful. You can't stop this kid inside you ranting and raving, but at least the wisdom in you is thinking, don't don't buy into this story. Mm -hmm. Let's say it's self-hate. Let's say it's I'm hopeless, I'm no good, I'm a failure. There's this raving, unhappy person in your head saying all those thoughts. The wise part of you will say, at least step back, Romina, don't believe it's true. Don't believe it's true. That's when you can't make the thoughts go away. But making them go away is wonderful. But if they're so strong because you've left them before, they're, you've left them alone and they're now out of control, at least try not to believe them. Let them rave on, but try not to believe the story. This is really massive. That's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. Okay, people, what else? What else? I have a question for uh, Jane. Yes, Barbara. So is awareness enough to um, eventually lead to restructuring that kind of self-talk? Uh, for example, I about 10 minutes ago, my laptop just shut off. Yeah, yeah right. I looked and it wasn't plugged in. And yeah. the first thing that came up, I was like incompetent, uh, anger. Yeah. That's right, that's right, that's right. That's right. Feelings. Exactly. That's right. And Earlier in my life, that would have been something enough to tip you over. For the day. Back. I would have never come back. You'd have never seen me. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I've yeah. made progress in yeah, as I get good. older, and yeah. I kind of accepted that. It's like okay, yes. you had this flash of that's you right. know, worrying that you offended or that that's you're right. angry or anything like that. But will that eventually go away? Will I become aware enough? Yeah, I understand. Kind of interrupt it. You know, again, I like to use ordinary, all the time ordinary examples really help for my mind because we often exaggerate and concretize and mystify what goes on in our mind. But you know yourself, if you're using the simple analogy, if you're learning to play music, there's various things involved. You have to, you know, I mean, he, okay, okay. Okay, so first of all, the important point here, I think what I'm saying is the words I'm saying here are in reference to Buddha's music. Use that analogy. You understand what I'm getting at here? The music we're using in this case, the, the, the model of the mind that I'm using in every word I say is the very precise, very clear presentation of the mind according to the Buddha. Now, it mightn't be evident if you've never heard Buddha psychology before. It might just sound like a bunch of nice words coming out of my mouth. You might like them. But it's coming from a very specific model of the mind. Where is it? I can't find you. You disappeared. Oh, there you are, Barbara. Are you hearing that point first? Yes. So that, yeah, it's up to you to decide if you use Buddha's model. You can use Jung, whoever you like. But I'm speaking from the very specific music, if you like. On my piano, I've got the music in front of me, and it's Buddha's psychology. And the little bit that I've learned of it, it's in reference to that that I'm describing. So, okay, using that as my analogy, and I'm trying to see my mind, and I'm trying to observe my mind. I'm trying to distinguish from the negative and the positive. So the part of your mind that you're utilizing is very clear. Like with the music, you're using this intelligent awareness that when you first study the theories of the music, you can say, well, there's D, there's F, there's something or other. You're using intelligence. You're using awareness, which is the ability to focus, plus it's imbued with intelligence. It's not just, see, the mindfulness meditation the starting one we're discussing, like with Judith, where you just observe with no with no opinion. That if you just think that's the only thing, which is awareness, that'll lead to idiocy because there's no there's no discrimination in that. Do you hear my point? First of all, Barbara, so that's yeah. necessary to start because we're so involved in all the crazy sounds. We've got to step out. Then you've got to add intelligence and discrimination to that focus. When you look at the notes on the piano, you can't. You've got to not just get not distracted. But you've also got to identify, is that correct? Is that right? Is that wrong? And then you can practice. So then if you're practicing and you're checking, did I play the right note? You don't get all mystical. You look at the notes in front of you. You look at the music in front of you. Did I do it accurately? So I'm using Buddha's model about the negative states, which have this neurotic, exaggerated, distorted, fear-based energy, and the positive states of mind that are reasonable, valid, interconnected. There's quite powerful kind of analysis of these two kinds of thoughts in us. So when you when you the more you have the ability to be aware, plus the discriminating intelligent component mixed together, that's the skill that you learn. And that's what you learn to learn anything. Whether you're trying to make a cake, 
If you can't concentrate, no matter how much you know theories of cakes, you'll never make a cake. But if you don't know theories of cakes, you're going to have concentration like iron, but you'll never make a cake. You've got to have both awareness and the intelligence of those theories and you mix those together. That's the skills you need to do the work internally, whether becoming a musician or a better human being. You with me, Barbara? Yes, I am. Thank it's you. It's a process, darling. Like anything, it's a process. But the irony of ego is we identify so strongly with the negative ones, like your example before, it throws us overboard and we kind of collapse. So we have to get become courageous to see the anger coming, the resentment, the idiocy, the self-hate, and just and then the positive parts of us getting braver, saying, shut up, Rabina, give it a break, mate. It's okay. You've got other qualities as well. You just get better and better at being your own friend, really. I swear to you, it's like that. And we just get and we just get as Tibetans say it, we say practice makes perfect, but Tibetans have a lovely way of putting it. They say nothing ever gets more difficult with practice. That's a nice, humble way of putting it. You're with me here. Yeah. It's awareness plus intelligence, discrimination, the two together, like you'd learn anything. You get my point here, Barbara? Yes. I don't necessarily want to only feel positive emotions because my thinking... Start again, start again. Say that again, what? My thinking is, is theoretically, I don't want to just feel positive things because I'm thinking that if Buddhism is the middle path, I need to be in the middle. I need to have the full range but maybe in my life I've dwelled too much on the negative mm -hmm. and need to counterbalance it with the I positive. Understand. That's the that interesting wrong? point. I think, no, it's okay. I hear your point. And I think that's a very typical way we would think I'd suggest we think in modern psychology because it almost seems too bizarre using our models of the mind in the modern world to think that you could have no anger, no attack. It seems a bit weird. But finally, that is what Buddha is suggesting. So just keep moving in. Because okay. the reason is, it's not a moralistic reason, it's because the Buddha says the more we identify attachment and anger and jealousy, they're the ones that cause us pain. And finally, we're, we don't want pain. And they blind us from seeing others and cut us off from others. So this is what nirvana means. Nirvana is not just some place like heaven. It's this word that Buddha has used to refer to when you really cut the rubbish altogether and he has found from his own experience that that's possible but that's way to go don't hold your breath you know good enough to get a balance wow pretty good that's excellent thank you that really helped everything you said wonderful so happy barbara so there you go people i cheated you 15 minutes again i'm so sorry